everyone. Welcome to our Protocol Labs research seminar. Today we are joined by Miguel Pinchera, who is currently a postdoc researcher at the Open IoT Research Unit of the Brunner Kessler Foundation. Miguel received his PhD from the University of Trento in Italy, has previously worked as a lecturer and robotics group tutor at the University of Biobio in Chile, and is currently interested in researching the integrations of the Internet of Things with other technologies. Today, Miguel will be talking about blockchain-based IoT system architectures and their practical implementation in agriculture. So Miguel, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Amy. So yeah, as Amy kindly introduced me, my name is Miguel Pincheira, and here uh, I'm here today to talk about our research. I work at the OpenID uh, unit, research unit, and particularly I want to talk about blockchain-based IoT system. So we are a base, an IoT unit, and we are exploring a uh, blockchain. Uh, as, um, as a research topic. And today in particular, I want to talk about practical implementation of this, this combination of IoT and blockchain for agricultural use cases. So the session today, I split it in four parts. First, I will start with an introduction of Internet of Things, a brief state of the art, what is leading us to our research. Then our approach to, to using blockchain in IoT systems and a proposed architecture for this integration of blockchain into IoT systems. Then I will present a few highlights that I found interesting from use cases, real use cases where we have used this architecture that integrates blockchain and IoT into agricultural domain. In particular, a water management system and, and another use case that is agri-food traceability. And then we wrap it up with conclusion and let's say future work that we are in envision. So first of all, uh, as a, to put us in context, I want to define what is the Internet of Things. And for that, I, I like to use this analogy that current statistics show that over 4 billion of people are currently connected to the Internet. So considering that we are more or less 8 billion of inhabitants for the planet, this means that uh, half of the population is connected to the Internet. In parallel to that, uh, this stat also showed that there are more than 23 billion of devices also connected to the to the internet. That means three times the population of the more or less three times the population of the entire world of devices that are connected to the internet. So uh, the term Internet of Things referred of these devices that are connected to the internet, but with a particular task that is uh, collecting data and creating or or creating, recollecting data to create application that will help people in daily activities. So all the network, the system, the software uh, that connect this device for this data interchange is what we can define as the Internet of Things in a more general way. Typically, the Internet of Things system, so how these, these devices are grouped, are, are ordered into systems that are, are relatively complex because there are several pieces that need to interact. And to make this system more easily, they are divided into layers. We typically talk about layer architecture of this software system, software and hardware systems. Um, all the devices have different capabilities, and for that have also different constraints in terms of computing power, energy requirements. And uh, this layer architecture is typically used to, to organize these systems. At the base layer, uh, there is called the device layer or the sensing layer, where the most smaller devices, typically the sensor, are located. These devices tend to favor size, smaller size and power um, consumption, less power consumption over processing capabilities or communication capabilities. So to overcome this limitation that the small size devices have, we have another layer that is typically called the edge layer, where more powerful devices provide missing capabilities to the sensors. This could be more network connectivity, more computing power, more storage capabilities. And on the top of this layer of uh, the devices and the edge, we found the cloud layer where we um, store and process all the information that is collected by the smaller devices. Typically on this cloud layer, there are the um, uh, the applications reside, so are the more the, the end layer of the system. Uh, in this context, the current IoT system favor a uh, close cloud-based centralized architecture, meaning that the top layer, the cloud layer, is typically on the cloud, and um, where a trusted intermediary, the service provider, provide different services for both the users of this application and the devices. Um, yeah. For instance, data management, authentication, that kind of services are provided at this layer. 
This centralized architecture uh, are easy or um, help to develop more easily this system and organize it more easily, but uh, they introduce a, a, an intermediary that can introduce uh, several um, potential issues to the IoT system related to security, related to uh, a centralized point of failure for an entire architecture, and many of the typical that if you are working with Web3 and blockchain, you know which one we, we want to move away from centralized systems. So in this case, the IoT is a really good candidate of uh, a centralized uh, infrastructure where we can rely on decentralized uh, application. That is why in the latest, in the recent year, there has been an increasing interest on blockchain technology for enabling decentralized IoT architectures. Um, these architectures um, tend to replace this cloud layer or even um, a smaller layer for this decentralized blockchain-based um, application or, 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 or systems. Um, and however, despite this growing interest, in, because it's really been growing from the last five, four or five years, there's still some research gap, as we can say. There are still points that need to be addressed. Um, particularly if we are looking from a practical point of view. My, my unit has really applied a practical approach to, to, to this topic, so we are really focusing on the practical issues that are still missing from the research. And one of the main issues, the first issue, is that the current literature, the current research that you can find, favor a smaller device with or consider that the sensors are devices more powerful than they really are. So what we are using is sensors that are more related to edge devices that are proper sensors, something really small with really low power requirements, which could be useful for some use case, but in the agriculture environment and the agricultural domain, when we use favor size and energy consumption, it's a really no, no to go. On the other hand, when you actually or the research consider small sensors, um, this typically needs to rely on another component. There is an intermediary. In this case, it's in, inside the system itself, but it's still an intermediary, which can also create uh, security issues. For instance, if you rely on the gateway in, and you get compromised the gateway, you get compromised a lot of sensors too. And finally, one other research cap or one point that we find we could exploit a little bit more is the fact that the smart contracts are really underused if you look at it from a software perspective point of view. So the key element of our research is to rely on blockchain to enable decentralized IoT architectures where we use constraints device, so real sensor, really small sensors. So the key elements are that the constraint devices are direct actors on the blockchain system. They are not intermediaries. The sensor itself should be part of the blockchain system. So they have a unique identity. In this case, for us, the identity is just the capabilities to manage the private or public keys for the cryptographic uh, functionalities that you need to do to be able to, to interact with a blockchain. And also the fact that the device is managing its own key, give it, give it let's say, a root of trust for the sensor data. And the sensor data is the key of the entire IoT system. Another uh, key element that we are actually focus also in our research is to use permissionless blockchains so public blockchains um, so in order to, to integrate um, the, the application itself, the, the agricultural application to many actors that you may not know, so really untrusted actors. Um, and the last point of the last point of the our approach is to actually rely on a smart contract as software platform. So when we are developing this blockchain-based application for agriculture, many of the business logic we try to, if not the entire business logic, we try to implement it on the blockchain itself. So using smart contract. This translates in our proposed architecture that we are going to, to talk a little bit more. Here, each device is a direct actor of the blockchain system with a unique identity, as well as any user of the blockchain has its unique identity in the sense of public, public and private keys that is managed by itself. The device itself is managing a pair of private keys that give him a unique identity. For us, at this stage of the research, managing the keys is enough to prove the identity, even though we know that blockchain could be enabled to, to elaborate or to provide more complex identity schemes, decentralized identity schemes. So for us, for now, the, managing the key and the device is good enough to start. Also, 
our approach to rely on the smart contracts as software components, we use the, the approach similar to the digital twin, this construct of information that is has a, a lot of um, fast words that, that is related to it. We, we use a similar concept in the sense that each device is represented on the blockchain by a smart contract that is a twin of this device on the blockchain. Um, where this smart twin is not, is not maintained or the information is not fed by the user, but directly by the sensor. And finally, we have another component that the, um, is a smart twin app. So another type of contract that relies on this smart twin on the blockchain to, to create the blockchain application itself for the IoT uh, system that we want to develop. So this architecture, we, we um, conceptualize a software framework. So we divide in software components. Uh, divided in three layers that try to match typically three layers that we saw before for our current IoT systems. Um, first of all, the, the framework is blockchain agnostic, so we are not thinking about any particular blockchain, just in it, uh, the smart contract capability, and that's all. Um, and then we divide in these two three models. The first model, the key model, let's say, of the architecture is the device model that provides the blockchain identity or the blockchain connectivity for the IoT device. In our architecture, the gateway, what is on the edge, acts as a transparent gateway. So nothing, nothing uh, here is done. Everything is going through the device through to the next layer, that is the blockchain layer, where are all the smart contract providing the application logic. So a really uh, straightforward application where the gateway that can be used for other um, communications uh, let's say task, in this case, it's not related to the data that is gathered by the sensor. It's just a transparent gateway providing a communication relay. Um, so one of the key of this software framework that we propose is the, the device model that we want to see, because that is what we convert a normal IoT sensor, a really constrained device in terms of computing power, memory, and this space into a blockchain actor, direct blockchain actor. Uh, which is actually a term that now you can find also as a trustworthy oracle, an oracle for the blockchain system. This device that has a unique identity is one step closer to be more or to be trustworthy than any other device that doesn't have the blockchain identity. So this device is the key of the architecture and what we try to evaluate and explode and see if it was actually something to, to actually work with. And the device is divided in, in three main tasks. The device itself performs six steps that are related to, to all the blockchain operations, sensing, and coding, hashing, but also all the communication are related to the IoT system itself. So to, some, to make it more easy, we divide this task of the device model into three main categories. Sensing, that is also just what a sensor normally does. The blockchain part that we try to, to insert in these devices, and then the communication, which is actually the typically uh, communication for any IoT devices. So at the end, the device model, what we try to prove or we want to evaluate and we research on is to how we add this blockchain part inside the sensor. With the, this proposed framework and this software framework uh, conceptualization, we try to evaluate it in, in different use case. And today I'm going to talk about two that are related to the agricultural domain. The first one is related to water management. In fact, it's, there's a reference for, for, for the entire research paper, if you're interested. And it's, it's talking about cost-effective IoT devices in a blockchain-based water management system. So the motivation for the use case comes for the, from the fact that more than 85% of fresh water is currently used for agricultural practices. So we know there is a water scarcity now and it has been for the last year. So knowing that 85% is used for agricultural practices means that we need to do something there. In that context, there is, we are working on a research project that is called Sapien, that is a collaborative research project between a water management company, a winery, a wine producer, and a farming cooperative here in Italy. The goal is to foster sustainable behaviors um, by reducing water consumption while preserving the quality and quantity of the crops yields. So still producing the same quality of quantity, but with less water consumption. And the idea behind this project is to use low cost battery power IoT devices, as we talked before, that water measure the water usage on the fields, but also that report that to a blockchain system and a blockchain infrastructure. And here in the blockchain infrastructure, we use a smart contract 
to provide uh, a trusted platform where it can include more uh, additional actors that maybe we don't know about yet that can provide incentives to, to foster these water savings. So we took our, our architecture and we elaborated into this use case that I'm going to briefly explain here. So we have the constraint devices, we have the twin contract that will represent the device on the blockchain, and we have the app contract that will provide the functionalities of the use case. In this case, everything related to, to water management. So first, uh, let's say a customer or a farmer A has a water a sensor that is measuring the water consumption on his farm, his or her farm. And uh, this uh, device is directly represented on the blockchain by a, a valve contract, a twin contract of this valve that is say, storing the information about the water consumption. And it's directly maintained by the sensor. The farmer doesn't have access or, or the control to, to tamper the information. The sensor reports the information. This can be replicated to, to, to many other valves uh, and many other farmers. And then what we do is we create another contract, for instance, to reward this water saving and the contract itself is managed by any actor that wants to foster this water saving. So we have the information about the water savings or water consumption. And then we can open this information in a blockchain, in a public blockchain, so open to anybody that can create a contract to foster these savings, whatever means necessary. For instance, by token, by money itself, or whatever you want to use there. And the idea is that this contract, this twin app uh, contract indirectly directly with the but, however, the, the, the more interesting part of the, the architecture itself, of the use case itself, is that we can replicate this to many other farmers, for instance, so many other farmers give the information and the reward can be extended to many other this part, but also include the functionalities of the water management system. For instance, the billing, where a service provider can use the same information that we store on the valve to do the, the payment of the water consumption and also some kind of foundation that can give certification saying that your product the farmer product produce uh, let's uh, is produced with less less water than the, the i don't know another similar product and all of these get automatically interact inside the blockchain and take advantage of this auditable and transparent record of information so that is our use case and that we wanted to implement so we took our software framework the one i presented before and uh, on this, let's say, first version, we tailor it to the uh, Ethereum blockchain. The software, the framework itself is blockchain agnostic, but we choose Ethereum for being one of the most, let's say, common platform in, in current literature and also at the time that we were doing this research. Uh, and we tailor our software framework to that. And the device model that we talk that is the key element of the architecture, we implemented as a cross-platform software library using C and Arduino IDE. Arduino is a platform for typically um, do it yourself sensor so it's really open and can be used in many many other different types of devices and considering that we also select six different platforms that are really low cost sensors that we see on this table um, furthermore we use a water flow sensor that we implemented we connected to the sensor and we use a shield for the communication here i want to make a, a, a highlight the the shield says that it's using LoRaWAN network. LoRaWAN network is a type of protocol communication that we typically use on agriculture or also smart city that allows you to, to have great coverage uh, with very low energy consumption and a large amount of coverage for digital, uh, for signal, for communication, but with the limitation of a slow speed and a slow payload. So you cannot send too much data and not too often. So there is a limitation that typically is, is well done or suitable for a, for normal IoT application, but could be a problem if we are using blockchain when we are in, adding more information than we want to share. In any case, going back to, to the devices, we have this table of devices where we use different types of devices. Arduino Uno, which is a really common and typically board that you can buy in any store, that is really easy to start to do in your own sensors or even more complex electronic products. But we also move it to more complex architecture that is still very low cost. And even more, we use a type of farm, hardware family that is uh, uh, the, the MIPS architecture, that is uh, um, a type of device or a type of architecture that you can still find on some kind of devices. The idea of choosing everything, all this kind of variation, is also to reflect that, as I told before, IoT system is typically composed of several types of devices that can be of any type of brand. So with this experiment, what we try to do is try to achieve as many as use cases possible. 
And one of the key elements here is that we focus on really constrained devices. As you can see, we have clock or processing power of the devices ranging from 16 hertz, megahertz, sorry, to 18 hertz, and memory ranging, ranging from 32 kilobytes to only 50 and uh, 512 kilobytes. All of them with um, a price lower than uh, 25 euros at the price of the, of the um, evaluation. And well, using this, using our VTEC tool, we want to see how this behave. Are these devices capable of being a blockchain actor? So send the information directly to the blockchain is what we evaluate in this uh, water management case. Uh, what we measured first was the footprint. So how much do we have to consume on this uh, device to include these blockchain functionalities in the sensor itself? And our statistics, our studies show that um, actually, even in the most constrained device, you are able to run the blockchain part. However, uh, as we can see there in the flashing part, including the, the communication is too much for a really constrained device as an Arduino that only has 32 kilobytes of memory. However, in the same implementation, we, we can see on the other boards, for instance, the M4L, there is a lot of space to include more functionalities as well as the communication as we did. So, uh, it's, it's, it's possible to include blocking, but depending on the communication that we want to use, we may need to use another board that is a little bit more, but still really, really constrained devices. In the same uh, spirit of benchmarking this, this this blockchain addition, we also mentioned the time consumption because, as we are going to see later, the, the processing times will help us to measure the energy consumption. And here we can see that actually creating the digital signature, which is one of the main tasks in the blockchain part, so to create a blockchain transaction, at least for the Ethereum use case, uh, the time range, the, this is the more time consuming um, task. And in the Arduino, the most constrained board is for four seconds to generate the transaction. However, a, a similar constraint board, but only with 32, kil 32 bits processing power, it's already less than one second, and we can see in the uh, rest of the board really short times. Moreover, if we compare to the, um, to the rest of the operation, we can see the transmission, so the communication part is still the highest time needed for all the other use cases. Also, we evaluate the compression. We had to add for doing the use case using this LoRaWAN technology that has limited payload for transmission. We have to reduce the transaction into a, a, a simple compression that on the one hand is able to fit on these constrained devices, but on the other hand provides enough compression to make the transaction fit into this payload that we have available for the LoRaWAN network. And actually, a simple dictionary compression that is really easy to implement on the device can provide almost 45% of compression of the transaction. Then one of the critical points for any IoT system is the energy consumption. So we measure with a tool that is called the OT device that provides um, really precise power consumption measurements at five volts, which was the typical use case. And we consider a needle time, so a rest time of the board as eight and eight seconds as reference without any low power consumption method. So um, the board without any low power mode, just the board in sleep mode and then working what we wanted to do. And as uh, the table shows the results in, um, in joules, while the, the graph provides the current consumption in milliampers. And we can see here that actually you can barely see any difference for any of the stage of the process. So no difference between sensing or creating the blockchain transaction. However, the, the communication is the highest peak of energy for our device. And taking this power consumption measurement, we estimate the energy budget of the, of the device, meaning that how much is going to, to use during the normal operation. This means how much energy is used in evil mode, so just waiting for anything to happen, plus the sensing time and the transmitting time, plus the blocking, that is what we are adding to this uh, evaluation. For this, we consider um, a reference irrigation schedule, since it's a water management system that varies for air from farmer to farmer, but in average, we can consider a irrigation schedule of two hours twice a day, and we evaluate two different monitoring cases. Continuous monitoring, when we are measuring, me measuring every 15 minutes during this time, this window of two hours of irrigation, or a reactive monitoring where we are measuring when you open the valve and when you close the valve. So just a elapsed of time and lots of elapsed water consumption during that two key points. And with this energy bite of this scenario, scenario of two hours twice a day, 
the results show that well, both monitoring cases, so continuous and reactive, the blockchain part is barely noticeable. As we can see, the most time consuming is idle, so just waiting for something to happen, although we didn't implement low power in those modes. But still, just after the idle, the sensing is the more consuming. So adding the blockchain part, as we can see, is really marginal to what we are consuming, which is a really good point to see that we can implement all of this on the blockchain sensor. So this is an, an ongoing project that is giving a really interesting result. We still need to, 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 to get the more concrete uh, results about the, the savings and everything. But so far, it's providing really interesting information about this use case. So we assess this, in, this architecture in incentivizing the virtual behavior. We are focused on evaluating the impact of blockchain on the devices. And our results show that actually really limited resources, so less than 25 euros with really limited memory space and power consumption can work as direct source data sources for blockchain system with minimal energy overhead. What is also really interesting are these constraint sensors can directly fit a smart contract that created this new type of application. In fact, using the public blockchain provides, uh, allow us to develop this kind of application where anybody can join to uh, foster this virtuous behavior of water saving. Uh, so that is really interesting for what we have learned from using a public blockchain, whereas there's still some uh, constraint regarding the time processing and, for instance, cost that we can talk in another time. Which leads us to our next um, use case, more or less the same principle. We want to test this, uh, uh, this architecture that we propose, but in this case, we want to really benchmark it and make a comparison between two different blockchain implementations. And in this case, we take, we take a paper that we, we work our first approach to blockchain and IoT system, which was for trustability applications. So the motivation in this use case is a little bit different that um, in agriculture, this has been a really interesting blockchain for trustability for the transparency that blockchain can provide. This is also led by consumers and authorities are demanding more information about the uh, food products that they consume. So uh, what they want is a transparent history of the entire process of the product from the farm, so wherever it was produced, to the final consumer and actually the table where you are consuming, the fourth part of the of the use case. To study this, we have a first, we did a first research paper in 2018 when we simplified agri-food process into six steps. And we also highlight where the sensors can produce information in this process across the entire six steps simplification, sorry. And um, also that uh, the smart contract can create new information during this process. But in that first version, we only evaluate at the gateway level. So our first approach, that was the main approach on the risk on the current literature at that time. So no sensor involved, the sensor was acting as usual, and the blockchain part was added at a gateway level. So when we have a, a little bit of more computing power. And at that time, we compare Ethereum uh, and so to as two other alternatives. But then we made a, a revisit version less year when we took the same use case but we went with more details and a more detailed also proof of concept implementation we use our architecture the same we use for the water management and we apply it to this trustability scenario here we also lower the price of the boards we we said okay this is more even more demanding for what we want to do there are more steps so we need to lower the cost and we set a baseline of 20 euros less than 20 euro for the board we wanted to turn um, and once again we focus on the device so how we do this? The use case, let's, um, we take all of the steps of the six steps of the trustability process, which is from the farm and finish on the consumer getting the, the food on the store, and we implement it on the blockchain. To, to, to make it more simple here, we only focus on the transportation. So for instance, when the farmer is sending the, the, the raw materials, the food, raw material to the processor where it's going to be processed. And here we consider that the, the transportation has, let's say, a, a couple of sensors inside the, the transportation station. For instance, it has a GPS, there's monitoring waypoints of the trajectory from the farmer to the processor, but it also has uh, environmental sensors that are measuring, for instance, temperature and humidity of the container where the, the food is transported. And for that, the, the, proce the processor, the one that is the receiving, has a, a, can create a delivery contract that is going to be, for instance, 
paying automatically on receivable. And this receivable is going to be estimated or, or uh, calculated in ba based on the waypoints that the GPS is reporting, but also considering that, for instance, no anomaly on the temperature was registered by the temperature sensor. So for instance, the delivery can set automatically set that if the temperature uh, passes some uh, threshold, let's say 30 degrees while transporting, the payment is not going to be made automatically. Following the same reasoning, we open the architecture for other actors to create other type of contract that automatically interact with the sensors on the transport. For instance, to transfer the ownership to different farmers or different actors in the system, or to get a certification for the retailer that the food is well preserved during the entire process, for instance. So once again, we focus on evaluating this, but this time we extended the library from Ethereum to Sawtooth, so another blockchain platform that is mostly used for private implementation. But the idea is to, to compare, see if the, our results that work for Ethereum can work also in other implementations. Um, we include, for instance, another board that is SP32 that has appeared in the recent year that is really common to see for do it yourself project that has really low cost. But the thing is that this board provides a lot of more resource on the same cost and the same um, power consumption. Still, boards that are less than 20 euros of price. Actually, the more expensive still the UN, uh, Arduino Uno, which is 18 euros, but you can find replacement that are not official, let's say, uh, Arduino made, but the similar architecture will weigh less than 10 euros for, for the board. And here we did another evaluation, also the footprints of this, including these blockchain operations on sensor, but comparing the two blockchain implementations. So, Ethereum on one hand, and so too on the other one. Regarding disk space, so how much program we need to put inside, we can see that the AV board can fit the zero implementation, but so too it's more demanding. We cannot fit on a normal board with only just 32 kilobytes of memory. Similarly, the, the 32 bits require more space and, and also it's not feasible. However, as we can see, for the six board, only two were not able to fit the, the, the proposed architecture in terms of disk space. Regarding memory, this more or less the same happened. We, we start noticing that the SO2 implementation, or at least our porting of the library to, to be able to interact with SO2, also has higher memory requirements. However, uh, really constrained device, in this case, only for SO2, only five of the six ports were able to handle the entire implementation. However, for Ethereum, as we saw before, we have no problems for even a really low constrained device. Ah, one comment here, we didn't focus on any communication technology as we did before for the water management when we use LoRaWAN. Here we open it to many other energy available communication technologies. So we just opt for a serial communication and simulation. So just to get a base reference, and then we can eventually try, for instance, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, or whatever we have available. But we're still focusing more on the blocking part. And as we can see here, we had a lot of space to continue working. What is interesting here is that the processing time for SOTO was almost twice the time for the Ethereum time. And this is related to the protocol. If you've ever seen how that blockchain transaction is made for SOTO, what the main difference is that requires two digital signatures. And obviously that doubles the time as we saw in the first use case is uh, the main time consuming task for creating blockchain inside the device, blockchain transaction, sir. And also that reflects on the transaction size. Uh, for Ethereum, the average size was 132, 34 bytes, where for SOTO is almost 19, 925 bytes, so a, long, a larger transaction. And, and these uh, high demanding resources also translate into energy, which is finally the main key of for IoT. Here we have an average graph of the energy consumption for Ethereum on top and SOTO. To estimate, we use the same machine, we use the same energy budget, so idle, just doing anything, sensing, uh, creating the blockchain information and transmitting. Uh, once again, we didn't implement no low power mode, so there is no um, low power when it's in middle mode. And that shows that why it's, it's currently the highest uh, energy consumption in the entire process. What was interesting here is that despite that Ethereum, sorry, SOTU requires more energy for creating a bigger transaction and also for transmitting a bigger transaction, when we put in the context of a daily energy usage for IoT sensor, it's still very, very low. It's less, actually, it's less than 1% of additional energy. So 
which also encourages us to, to say, okay, we can still use this constraint device to be part of a blockchain-based system for at least for our use case that we were evaluating, which will open the door to use this uh, smart contract that are really relying on this sensor as trustworthy oracles. That also enables to develop this blockchain-based application using the smart contracts or relaying also entirely on the blockchain uh, network. Summarizing, we assess the blockchain-based traceability application in this case with an event-based traceability case study. Ah, here I want to make an observation. Typically, when you work with IoT, you talk about collecting a lot of data. So to, to don't over, over um, saturate and over consume information on the blockchain, we just create some event-based monitoring. For instance, when we do in water management, we talk about measuring irrigation and a certain certain time interval that was quite long, let's say 50 minutes, or event when you open or close the water valve. And here the same, we were measuring certain uh, events. For instance, when we're doing the transportation, uh, certain uh, GPS waypoints only register, not the entire uh, path. And also when we have some anomalies on the temperature on the humidity, not the entire information on the blockchain itself. This can still be sent to the typically normal IoT system. And once again, our show show that this constraint device can work also in this scenario, comparing even two different um, blockchain implementations underlying it, Ethereum and Sawtooth. Uh, what we show is clear that a small variation in the protocol, as I told before, the sort of protocols used to, to do two different signatures, two different state of signatures for the data, which create a lot of more resource in the demand on the sensor itself. Despite this, the constraint sensors can uh, still be used with both implementation with minimal impact on the resources, whereas the processing time, the memory, and the most important, the energy budget that is one of the key elements for IoT devices, particularly in agricultural uh, environments. Let's wrap it up what we have, what have presented today. So our research focused on integrating blockchain technology into the Internet of Things to develop new type of decentralized IoT applications. Uh, and for that, we propose an architecture that considers constraint sensor devices, really small IoT devices that open a lot of use cases, particularly in agriculture. And the other key element of our architecture is to use a smart contract to implement the application logic, the application platform. Uh, we have validated this architecture in two different use cases, uh, one for water management and one for traceability. And in both cases, the constraint sensors constrained in the terms of memory space, uh, this space, uh, cost and energy requirements can work with uh, a really common platform as Ethereum and also on private implementation as Sotu. Uh, and what is really also really important to highlight, the, the smart contract, we're able to provide the software platform to develop the logic of every use case in this uh, use, uh, use case that we uh, show. As future work on, on this research, what we continue uh, or want to do is to, to port this library. Since we started in Ethereum, we want to sort it. We also would like to try the different implementations. For instance, Hyperlay Fabric that has been really used in current literature for blockchain experiments. And for that, also estimating more accurate energy consumption and using other communication technologies. We evaluate the most constraint, that was LoRa one, but we could also start using uh, 3G, 4G, or even the new 5G generation. And also, one is uh, an ongoing research is related to the smart contract formal security analysis. So we can say how much secure, how secure are these blockchain based applications, and also infra infrastructure costs that actually are ongoing, really active uh, to estimate how much it's going to cost, for instance, when we are using public or what we have to pay if we want to create our own private infrastructure and also another interesting topic is to try to implement or migrate or adapt this architecture to um, layer two architecture so this is secure channel of uh, between when we are using public uh, network that is uh, what is we are envisioning in our research so that's all thank you so much for this invitation for letting me time to talk about what we do here in the open iot unit could be here now or later there is my contact information so please free to contact at any time thank you so much miguel for taking the time to talk with us i really appreciate it